Welcome to Open Secrets, Episode 8, The Culture Industry by Theodore Adorno. Um, before we get started, I have to apologize. It's been a while since uh, we've had an episode. That's because, well, people don't know this, but I actually recorded like three or four episodes before we started actually airing them um, to give me some time just in case I encountered a book that required a lot of my extremely limited Pollock brain power. Um, and that's what this book is. This book is actually very, very difficult. It is incredibly deep. And um, there's a lot of rich content that is very important for people to understand, understand. And though this book was written quite a while ago, it rings more and more true all the time. Um, before we get into it though i would like to talk about our first sponsor which is life vantage biohack your life with supplements and body care with stephanie Kronelka and life vantage a science-based company that has dedicated its time to help people reach their health and wellness goals products can assist with personal skin and hair care immune system health anti-aging solutions and even pet health for more information, check out stephk.lifevantage.com or text 701-230-9306 or email skbesthealth at gmail.com. Biohack your life. And I must say, you know, I did a little research into this product myself and it's actually quite impressive. Most, you know, companies and say their their stuff is science-based and it, in, in a sense it is definitely science-based there is science conducted experimenting on these things um, but it turns into something a product that is is actually not very good for you while well, this actually does do a lot of what it says it does and the biochemistry is there for it let's put it that way so without further ado let's get into the culture industry theodore adorno now, this book actually wasn't a book written to be put together like this as such. This is a collection of nine different essays. This will be our first two-episode book because though the book doesn't look very substantial, it's only a couple hundred pages, again, it is very challenging language used in here and very challenging concepts. Um, Theodore Adorno was in my opinion, the highlight of the Frankfurt School. The Frankfurt School was a group of philosophers that lived in Germany and Frankfurt, and they came up with a what is called critical theory. And what they did is they used philosophy and rhetoric to criticize every pillar of culture, every p pillar of Western society, and they absolutely you know eviscerated it as a result the frankfurt school is thought to be kind of the birth of cultural marxism now marxist ideology certainly did not take hold in the united states of america when it was taking hold of a lot of other places in the world the reason is because america well it's not just a simple reason there's many reasons for it but america had a very strong cultural heritage, a very strong religious heritage. And certainly after Marxism took over, you know, the USSR, they saw America as their antithesis, their enemy. And while they could not defeat them militarily, of course they could not defeat, you know, the greatest military power on earth, they tried to devise a way to, you know, destroy America from within, so to speak. Now, last week, or the last episode, excuse me, was on the cultural Cold War and how the Central Intelligence Agency actually played a massive hand, a massive role in engineering the culture of Europe, um, as well as here in America. While that is the kind of nuts and bolts of how it was done and how cultural you know, takeover worked, this is the philosophies of how this works. And because this is critical theory, I have to warn you, um, this is not for the faint of heart. Um, these, these principles and ideologies that we're going to be talking about here are going to hit home with basically all of you um, because Theodore Adorno applies this critical theory to 
We're going to be talking about music. We're going to be talking about television. We're going to be talking about all these things within our culture, sports. Um, and he absolutely eviscerates these things. And again, this, this, the first essay we're going to get into was written in 1938. Just to give you some perspective, most of this is written in the 40s and 50s. And he was absolutely prescient in what he was saying. And so also I'll give a warning. It's going to, the way he writes, he does not make his material approachable in any way, shape, or form. So while the words that are going to be coming out of my mouth are English, and you're going to recognize them as English, um, they are certainly not when strung together. They just certainly don't make a lot of sense, and they really require a lot of attention. So, um, it's, so please bear with that but, and, and work with it. It's, it's, again, it's difficult material, but you will find that when you struggle with it, you come away understanding things a lot better and a lot uh, more clearly. So... Before we get into this, I have a few questions I would like to, you to keep in the back of your mind as we proceed through this. First is, is my liking of a cultural product, so a piece of mu a music, a, a piece of art, a television show, um, sports, whatever, is your, is your liking of a cultural product due to the inherent characteristics of who you are, who I am, or is it a manufactured liking? And if it is manufactured, what is the purpose of, of that cultural product? And also, if you identify or if I identify myself with thousands of cultural products, you know, when someone asks you, who are you, what is your answer? Is it, oh, I, I like this band and, you know, I watch these shows and I do this. And then like you, that's how you conduct your life is talking about and thinking about these cultural products. And if that's the case, what does that say about you or me? Like, and who are you at that point if that's what you, you do and that's how you, you, you think of yourself? So... Without further ado, we're going to get into the first essay, <clears throat> and it is called On the Fetish Character in Music and the Regression of Listening. Yes, you can see, serious business here. <clears throat> and the first part, we're going to be talking about what Theodore Adorno calls light music. And before we get, I should mention too, Theodore Adorno, um, there's a lot of conspiracy theories about him. Let's put it that way. I don't know which ones are true. Um, but he has multiple PhDs, had, he, he passed away in 1963, I believe it was, or 69, so, somewhere in there. Um, he had multiple PhDs. One of them was in music theory. And some of the conspiracy theories about him is that he had a hand in creating what we now know as modern pop music. And not, and clearly as we go through this, it's not because he liked that music. If that is, if these conspiracy theories are true, again, it's always important to, keep these conspiracy theories in mind and think about them because truth lies in the conspiracy theory. So what Theodore Adorno calls light music would be, you know, pop music. And for him, it's basically everything except for the, you know, extreme awesome, you know, um, classical productions, you know, classical music style symphonies and stuff that that was serious music for him but light music was basically everything else. In fact, in the, as we, I don't think I, it's in our reading today, but there's a song he refers to called Pupchen, P-U-P-P-C-H-E-N. It came out in 1913, and that's what he was saying is light music. And it's very interesting if you, you know, YouTube that song and check it out. It's, <laughs> it's kind of funny. But uh, so he, he's referring to light music here again, okay? Light music is also affected by the change in that the entertainment, the pleasure, the enjoyment it promises is given only to be simultaneously denied. In one of his essays, Aldous Huxley raised the question of who, in a place of amusement, is really being amused. With the same justice, it can be asked whom music for entertainment still entertains. Rather, it seems to complement the reduction of people to silence, the dying out of speech as expression, the inability to communicate at all. If nobody can any longer speak, then certainly nobody can any longer listen. In the conventional complaints about declining taste, certain motifs constantly recur. There is no lack of pouting and sentimental comments assessing the current musical condition of the masses as one of degeneration. The most tenacious of these motifs is that of sensuality, which allegedly enfeebles and incapacitates heroic behavior. So there's a lot going on here. 
the light music he's saying so the pleasure the enjoyment of promises is given only to be simultaneously denied now why is that because while you derive pleasure from listening to music that pleasure you seek that the content that the music is trying to express and present to you you are experiencing it through this medium called music okay and it's a fake it's a facsimile it's a surrogate it's a you're experiencing a false and unacceptable example of the real thing so instead of you know let's let's use you know of course music today is full of sexuality right so instead of experiencing the actual act itself you're experiencing cardi b shaking her yoohoo up there and then saying all these words right or whatever she mean that's like literally the most inarticulate music i've ever heard in my life it's not even music but but that's what's happening right and so you're experiencing some other person's presentation of that event through crap music like total total garbage right and so while you're getting this these little hits of pleasure like taking a drug almost you know through song it is never ever possible that you can achieve the real thing through just simply listening to it and it says rather it seems to complement music this light music complement the reduction of people to silence the dying out of speech as expression the inability to communicate at all if nobody can any longer speak then certainly nobody can any longer listen that's one thing that is absolutely prevalent in all cultural products and again he's talking about music and as you can see here why it took a while to get through this i think i read every page of this book probably three times um but it's important it's very important so cultural products are as, as we understand them now as we consume them now and we're talking about music here specifically they have what's called linguistic minimalism in that which means they are lessening the vocabulary of the people that listen to them and <laughs> one example of this in our culture that to me is most extreme is if you watch video games or you play video games you know talk to a teenager who is totally addicted to video games what comes out of their mouth probably sounds foreign to you if you don't play that video game you're like what the hell are you talking about you know you have no idea and it's these simple short little stupid nonsensical words and if that is all that this person consumes or or again like cultural products if that's what they're consuming and that's what they're talking about their language is being reduced thus their ability to express concept thoughts is being reduced because they don't have the language to express those thoughts and because they don't have the language because the language is being removed from them they don't know they don't have the ability to think these thoughts anymore so we're talking here about really truly powerful tools of engineering humanity that is exactly what's happening here <clears throat> he says there's no lack of pouting and sentimental comments assessing the current musical condition of the masses as one of degeneration of course i mean again all you have to do is <laughs> look at some of the most famous songs even in the last three four decades it has been hyper sexualized nonsense nothing to elevate humanity it's always degeneration and it gets worse and worse and worse. And again, the, the whatever, the Cardi, I don't even, honestly, I don't, I don't pay attention to music really at all, but like the pop music and stuff, you know, it's, it's even worse now than it was when I was a child and it was really bad then. So we see this, this mechanism of degeneration. <clears throat> so, and again, that's important here also. Yeah. The most tenacious of these motifs is that of sensuality which allegedly, and it's not really not allegedly, it, it does enfeeble and incapacitate heroic behavior. Again, if, you're, if, if the value system of your society is being pushed through these cultural products, which it undeniably is, and your value system is the degeneracy, you are not going to have people being virtuous, being heroic. And this is an age now where we absolutely need people to be doing this and the opposite is occurring because of what is the culture industry at large and that's again the title of this set of essays is the culture industry and we will certainly be getting much more into that <clears throat> now we're going to get into some um marx 
uh, Marxian philosophy, Marxist philosophy, excuse me here. And this is talking about the what music is really in terms of its place in, in our culture. The concept, and, and he's going to talk about here about musical fetishism, okay? And musical fetishism is to him is if you like a, a song or something, you like Lady Gaga, right? Let's say, for example, you like, you're a big fan of Lady Gaga, and it doesn't matter what she puts out, it doesn't matter the content of her songs, it doesn't matter what the songs actually sound like, even though to me they all sound the same, they're all pushing the same crap. But if you like Lady Gaga and you listen to it exclusively because of Lady Gaga, then you are a musical fetishist because you will listen to anything that Lady Gaga does simply because Lady Gaga is there. It's like if you are, you know, you liked Eddie Van Halen because he was an awesome guitarist and it didn't matter what, you know, what, who his lead singer was or who was playing behind him as you liked everything that Eddie Van Halen does because you were a big fan of his guitar playing. That is musical, musical fetishism. It's kind of the reverse of you're missing the forest for the trees. You're seeing the forest, but you're missing, or you're seeing the trees, but you're missing the forest because you only care about this one specific aspect of this piece of music, piece of art writ large. And so that's a musical fetishist. And for him that destroys it removes the piece of art's ability to transcend and bring bring you to higher ideology because you are stuck in the Eddie Van Halen mode. Not that Van Halen had anything redeeming about them, but but you hopefully get my point there. It says the concept of musical fetishism cannot be psychologically derived. That values are consumed and draw feelings to themselves without their specific qualities being reached by the consciousness of the consumer is a later expression of their commodity character. Commodity character, you are a commodity. For all contemporary musical life is dominated by the commodity form. Saying music has now conformed itself to be a cultural product that you buy and consume. That's it, it's the process of consumption that is dominant in you, in the, in the consumer. <clears throat> the last pre-capitalist residues have been eliminated. Music serves in America today as an advertisement for commodities, which one must acquire in order to be able to hear music. If the advertising function is carefully dimmed in the case of serious music, it always breaks through in the case of light music. The consumer is really worshiping the money that he himself has paid for the ticket to the concert. We'll get there. We'll get. We'll explain what that what he's talking about here. The specific fetish character of music lies in this quid pro quo. Quid pro quo is like, hey, I'll do a favor for you, but you're gonna owe me later. The feelings which go to the exchange value create the appearance of immediacy at the same time as the absence of a relation to the object belies it. So exchange value. Here is where we're getting into some, some philosophical terms. Exchange value is literally the dollars and cents of the concert ticket or the, the CD or the album, I guess is the better word for it now. The album. Okay. It's you just the, the whatever money you put into it, that's all you're going to get out of it. Cause it's just something that you're going to consume. That's it. Period. What stands in opposition to the exchange value is what's called use value. It's something that, it, like a tool, has a specific shape to perform a, fixture, a specific function because it has a use value. A hammer has a use value of nailing you know, you know, nails into a wall or what have you. Okay, Music ha should have a use value and that it elevates people to a, a certain ideologies. It expresses things that can't be expressed other than how a truly gifted artist sees those things but in forming music into a commodity which is basically all i've experienced since i've been alive in this country certainly you know it's all just this exchange value thing it's all commodity for mass consumption what happens is you're removing the use value you're removing the higher ideals for from music and that's not to say that there aren't some artists that produce some songs that have a wonderful use value and that do elevate people. It does happen occasionally. Um, but it's incredibly rare nowadays, especially the, the absolute trash that they are pushing onto us. The change in the function of music involves the basic conditions of the relation between art and society. The more inexorably, that means relentlessly, the more inexorably the principle of exchange value destroys use values for human beings, 
the more deeply does exchange value disguise itself as the object of enjoyment, saying you, exchange value is being consumed over and over again just for itself. Why? Because of what we talked about earlier, because it is a facsimile. You're just you, you're buying a little hit of a drug essentially, and you're not getting the real drug that the, 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 the not the drug the real experience that this music is replacing. Transfer of the use value of consumption goods to their exchange value contributes to a general order in which eventually every pleasure which emancipates itself from exchange value takes on subversive features. The woman who has money with which to buy is intoxicated by the act of buying, the act of buying, the act of consuming. You just keep doing it over and over again because that's how you and I and all of us are trained to be. We're trained to live for this exchange value. Just consume, consume, consume. Consumption begets consumption. <clears throat> before the theological caprices, caprices are like whims, before the theological caprices of commodities, the consumers become temple slaves. Those who sacrifice themselves nowhere else can do so here, and here they are fully betrayed. So, yeah, we're going to get into some what this means even at a deeper level, but essentially exchange value which is that money value, which is a total superficial experience. And so people that live for exchange value lead superficial and unhappy lives and are thus betrayed by the culture industry, by the mass manufacture and advertisement and deception that is involved in us becoming consumers of consum just cultural goods that are just only to be consumed and not to elevate us, okay? So you can see he, uh, you know, he uses some quite interesting language. <laughs> the masochist mass culture is the necessary manifestation of almighty production itself. Uh, masochism is driving, driving self-pleasure from pain, you know? So sadism is when you in, draw pleasure from inflicting pain upon others. Masochism is when you inflict pain upon yourself and, you know, achieve pleasure that way. So the masochistic mass culture is the necessary manifestation of almighty production itself. So again, production, producing all these things is inducing us to, you know, just consume these things of mass production, which is actually hurting us, but, but we're dri deriving pleasure from it. When the feelings seize on exchange value, it is no mystical transubstantiation. It corresponds to the behavior of the prisoner who loves his cell because he has been left nothing else to love. The sacrifice of individuality, which accommodates itself to the regularity of the successful, the doing of what everybody else does, follows from the basic fact that in broad areas, the same thing is offered to everybody by the standardized production of consumption goods. So he's saying you're a prisoner in our, in our society of mass consumption. If this is what we do as a people is just consume, consume, consume. We are the prisoners who fell in love with our own cells, cells, CEL cells, because there's nothing else left to love. Truly, I mean, this culture industry has stripped that the value system and the mores of our world and replaced it with materialism and mass consumption. That's what he's referring to here. But the com again, and then the consumption of goods is the good in our society of itself. But the commercial necessity of connecting this identity leads to the manipulation of taste and the official culture's pretense of individual, individualism, which necessarily increases in proportion to the liquidation of the individual. So the more people think we are free in America, the more people think that we are individuals. And again, go, I mean, how many people have tattoos nowadays, for example? Most people have tattoos. It used to be a, a, a rare thing, but now it's just a mark of the society, the culture industry you're putting on yourself. Most people tattoo themselves with stupid like show things or sports or whatever inane things they want to tattoo themselves with they're they're branding themselves a slave to this society and as a result though however what 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 is happening here and what he's talking about also is this exchange value that people are just consuming is actually destroying individualism as that tattoo example points out is it's it's destroying 
a true individual and everything, everyone is just a consumer, period, point blank. And their ideals, again, come from consumption and the material goods being forced upon them. The identical character of the goods, which everyone must buy, hides itself behind the rigor of the universally compulsory style. <clears throat> get my next one. Oh, that was it. Yeah, so, again, so yeah, all this compulsory style, this is all light music is the same formula. It's a standardized product. Um, rap, rock, pop, country, all of it, there's no difference anymore. Really, there isn't. And especially in terms of exchange value. So, people that consume country music and wear cowboy hats and whatever, I, I, again, I haven't listened to country music in so long, I don't know. I'm pretty sure that they're kind of blending all these different styles of music anyway to make it obvious that there are no longer any differences. But um, there's no, again, there's no difference simply in the style of music. And there's certainly no difference in the aspect of everyone that listens to this is not being elevated to use value, to purpose. They're being degraded to exchange value and are like everyone else in the sense that they're just consuming, consuming, consuming. <clears throat> they are called individualists, and yet their work is nothing but a single dialogue with the powers which destroy individuality. Powers whose formless shadows fall gigantically on their music. He's talking about a couple artists here who uh, Schoenberg and Webern, I've never heard of these people, um, but how their music is, you know, supposedly anti-establishment. He says they are called individualists. Again, think of all these artists who now call themselves anti-establishment. That's not even, I think I've noticed one thing too recently is that that's not even a thing anymore is artists really are happy to support Coca-Cola, you know, <laughs> or whatever. So they are called individualists and yet their work is nothing but a single dialogue with the powers which destroy indiv individuality powers whose formless shadow falls gigantically on their music and their that formless shadow has is all music now in music too collective powers are liquidating an individ, indiv, an individuality past saving but against them only individuals are capable of consciously representing the aims of collectivity now what this means is we're so far through especially now again this is 1938 he wrote that this first essay you know we're so far through the looking glass now and even people who call themselves so-called individuals, they have absolutely, utterly been raised in this system of this form of shadows that fall upon all of these cultural goods that we are consuming, such that our thought patterns, our perception of reality is so dictated by these guys that even if we sense something is wrong, we're only able to muster collectivist arguments against them. You know, and I got to feel... There's so much strangeness happening in our in our society now. I mean, if you look at the uh, furry phenomenon, the phenomenon of furries. I mean, don't look too far because it gets you know pretty real and pretty disgusting pretty fast. But you, you know, these these people are obviously meant totally mentally disordered, but they're raised in a system that is a lie, a, a fabrication, and they can't put words to the problem. And they can't find out who they truly are because you cannot find out who you are as a person if you again you define yourselves by the culture industry and that that anxiety that 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 strife of character manifests itself in very strange ways now and it's, it used to be you know you had a tattoo and you, you know you dye your hair i guess that was only 15 before that you wouldn't dye your hair but now but now it's just it's, it's turning so uh, flagrantly extreme that I honestly don't know how much farther it can go, but you can see what's happening is, is people try and be individuals. They only know how to be so-called individuals through these cultural products that they're consuming. And they're trying to be uniquely individual so that they become an animal or, <laughs> you know, whatever. It's, it's a very strange phenomenon. The second essay is called The Schema of Mass Culture. I put up here also how culture industry preforms experience. So again, digging even deeper, our schema of our reality here. The commercial character of culture causes the difference between culture 
and practical life to disappear. Again, our, our uh, culture is exchange value. On all sides, the borderline between culture and empirical reality becomes more and more indistinct. Thorough efforts in this direction have been long underway. Okay, let's, again, thorough efforts in this direction have been long underway, meaning there are people directing this. Again, people, he's saying, the culture goods that we are consuming are shifting our perception of what is real. Since the beginning of the industrial era, an art has been in vogue, which is adept at promoting the right attitudes and which has entered into alliance with reification. Reification is taking abstract ideas and then bringing them into physical reality. So, I'll read that again. Since the beginning of the industrial era, an art has been in vogue, which is adept at promoting the right attitudes and which has entered into alliance with reification, again, bringing these right attitudes based on some now physical realities, insofar as it proffers, offers precisely for a disenchanted world, for the realm of the prosaic and even the banasic, which is uh, a commonplace, a poetry of its own nourished, Poetry of its own, nourished upon worth e work ethic. Goebbels then prescribed it in the form of an iron romanticism for totalitarian purposes. Again, this they're making real a, a, a culture, a false reality to suit their own purposes. Goebbels did it in, in Nazi Germany. And he even... Will be, the, will be the second episode we'll get into some of what was going on in Nazi Germany, which is fascinating. <clears throat> he talks, then he's going to talk about bourgeois education. Okay. Bourgeois, so for people that don't know, these terms were talked about specifically in regard to like the USSR, right? Where you had the proles, the proletariat, which was the poor people, and you had the bourgeois, and for all intents and purposes, that was it. But there was actually a layer above, which was the true masters of the USSR. The bourgeois were the um, middle class, if you will, but they were definitely upper crust in the USSR just because in the USSR, the proletariat was the, the vast majority of the people that lived in the USSR, okay? And he's going to talk about even bourgeois education. But America, as just as a, a comparison, America was mostly bourgeois. Right? It was most, mostly middle, middle class. There was very lo little poverty and very little extreme wealth in America in its heyday. That is dis being destroyed. You can see the, the cultural Marxism, the communism, socialism creep, creep in the United States as the bourgeois, us middle class people, which is you know, virtually all of us, the, the, our, the percentage of bourgeois in America is, is you know, creeping down big time. So he, he says, bourgeois education officially had an education that is oriented towards the realm of ideal. And he was bourgeois educated. It encourages admiration for the heroic individual and glorifies the values of candor, unselfishness, and generosity. He's getting, so even like, you know, the proles didn't get this, the, these ideals taught to them. You know, the proletariat, the poor people, they didn't get the ideal, these, you know, use value type things taught to them. But the bourgeois did get that, but yet, from their earliest youth, the bourgeois, all of this is only admitted on the condition that there is not, after all, to be that's not to be taken seriously. With every gesture, the pupil is given to understand that what is most important is understanding the demands of real life and fitting oneself properly for the competitive realm, and that the ideals themselves were either to be taken as a confirmation of this life or were to be immediately placed in its service. So he's saying even the bourgeois were cogs in the wheel, right? Even though they were given some of the, you know, high art of yesteryear and they were taught some of the fine literature and, and, and th actually got to think about it and talk about it in some classes, it was, it was still kind of a hand-waving thing like, eh, but that's not what you're really going to have to worry about or concern yourselves with because you're just going to be plugged into the administrative bureaucracy machine you just get to be, you know, wear nicer clothes and get a lot more money than all those, you know, many, many millions of peasants out there that are working, doing the labor, okay? <clears throat> Beneath the mantle of adventure, they smuggle in the contraband of utility. 
and the reader is persuaded that he does not have to renounce any of his dreams if he eventually becomes an engineer or a shop assistant. Those dreams which in a class society are already enthralled as in service in slavery to the world of things and directed towards the imago. Imago, it's actually, you know, it's, it's actually I-M-A-G-O. Ima, imago, imago, I don't know how to pronounce it, is actually the ideal image. This is what that stands for. So the ideal image of the train driver and the pastry cook, even before the reliable children's literature has been unleashed upon him. So again, even in the adventure, even in the fiction, this is true. People must understand this fiction, television, Harry Potter, blah, 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 Lord of the Rings, all that stuff. That is the primary means by which people are programmed nowadays. You know, again, you sit down to enjoy a, you know, a nice Netflix show or whatever, and your defenses are down. Your intellectual defense mechanisms go away, and then you're there. You're an open book. You, that's again. This is why they call it programming, right? Is because of this right here. They're programming. He was saying the bourgeois were programming to be an engineer or a shop assistant, you know, whatever. That's absolutely what happens to us. <clears throat> Today, total mass culture has replaced the new world. It is solely the power which stands behind this everyday poetry and impresses us with its color fast and lavish presentation that can still deceive adult human beings about the extended childhood that is only prepared for them so that they might function in all the more adult a fashion. So what is he talking about here? We're programmed to behave according to what mass culture considers adult behavior. Again, the big one here is, is sex in our society. It's, you're trained that it's an adult thing to go lose your, your virginity, you know? And that if you're, not, if you're not losing your virginity by the time you're in, you know, 14 or 15, you're, you're so, there's something wrong with you. And there, we're taught that the adult thing is to go get hammered every night and go sleep around. And that's the adult fun, 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 right? That's adult behavior nowadays. And that's what he's talking about here. An extended childhood, they, this culture industry and the cultural products present a, a, I'll just read it again. It is solely the power which stands, and again, he's saying here, there's a power that stands behind this. He, he gets into it big time. There's an entire essays on the administrative class, how culture is given to you. It is not a natural thing. It is produced, highly produced to consume you. So he says, it is solely the power which stands behind this everyday poetry today and impresses us with its color fast and lavish presentation. Ooh, think about all those flashy, beautiful lights and how her hair is perfect and he's wearing the nicest suit and blah, 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 right? That's what he's talking about here. And this lavish presentation that can still de deceive adult human beings about the extended childhood that is only prepared for them so that they might function in, a, in all the more adult a fashion. A poetic tremor is expected of every example of emphatic, emphatic objectivity. The O of astonishment, which the objective close-up still stifled, is blurted out by the lyrical musical accompaniment. Again, when you're watching a show, when you're watching a movie, you're watching them, everyone. This is why, actually why um, Elvis Huxley never went to a movie, because he, 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 he understood what it is doing to you. It's programming you. I mean, when you go to a movie theater, you're in a movie with 100 other people, whatever it is, and you're all reacting emotionally to the exact same things all at the exact same time it's actually a very strong and powerful understanding once you once you begin to see it this tremor that you experience now this tremor you experience when you're watching this movie or whatever this tremor lives off the excess power which technology as a whole along with the capital that stands behind it exercises over every individual thing i'll read that one again the tremor lives off the excess power which technology as a whole, along with the capital that stands behind it, exercises over everything. So let's work backwards here. We have capital that is dominating technology, which is producing this cultural product that is causing this tremor in you. And it is through capital, through the, the money powers that are exercising this force over all of us. This is what transcendence is in mass culture. Again, not transcendence at all, at all, is it? The poetic mystery of the product in which it is more than itself consists in the fact that it participates in the infinite nature of production and the reverential awe inspired by objectivity fits in smoothly with the schema of advertising. It is precisely this stress upon the mere fact of being which is supposed to be so great 
and so strong that no subjective intention can alter it in any way. You know, it's kind of, it's, it's this, it, it's, it is so interesting, you know, because these, there are movies that are, again, good. There are some movies that are good and explanatory and, and can elevate you, right? But, you know, we all have this, he's talking about these, this tremors again that we're experiencing because there, that is tapping into some aspect of human nature that is objective and explanatory that we can all identify with. But it's, again, he's saying it's being used to deceive us. You know, it's just, again, it's a scientifically produced thing that's the thing with with our modern advancement and understanding of human behaviorism human psychology and then again the couple that with the technology that are that is going into movies now you know it is a scientifically targeted thing to deceive that's what he's saying and this stress corresponds the true impotence of art in relation to society today that conceals the transfiguration against which all sober objectivity gestures reality becomes its own ideology through the spell cast by its faithful duplication. So he eventually, I don't know if we're going to get, he calls it the ever same, ever same. It's the same thing over and over and over and over again. Uh, I think later he will, the next episode we'll get to, he calls it daddy cinema because like you had your forerunners of movie production and everything is just a rep repetition, repetition, repetition. How many more X-Men movies or wh whatever are we going to go see? How many more, you know, Westerns or bank heists? There's nothing new is what he's saying. There's nothing new, and the ideology is a spell that's being cast through these cultural products, the art, the, the music, the movies, just over and over and over and over again, and nothing is new. Any achievement, so any achievement of imagination, any expectation that imagination might, of its own accord, gather together the discrete elements of the real into its truth is repudiated as an improper presumption. Imagination is replaced by a mechanically relentless control mechanism which determines whether the latest imago, again, the ideal image, to be distributed really represents an exact, accurate, and reliable reflection of the relevant item of reality. Again, imagination is being replaced by the images you see on your television screen. And we see them over and over and over again. We're addicted to them. We come back night after night, time after time. People don't even, they, they fear silence now, you know? They fear thinking for themselves. They have to have earbuds in their ears all the time listening to something, listening to some guy talk. I mean, granted, I realize the irony of that because that's what I am to most of you, I'm sure. Um, is just a dude talking on the internet, but stop and pull those earbuds out. Enjoy the silence. Think, think for yourself. It's so important. Get you again. If your imagination is seeded exclusively by culture, cultural products, whose imagination is it? The work of art becomes its own material and forms the technique of reproduction and presentation. Actually, a technique for the distribution of a real object. <clears throat> Here we go. The affair of Orson Welles broadcast the invasion from Mars. Okay, so back in the day when this happened, there, I believe it was pre-television pre set. People gathered around. They got most of their entertainment from radio broadcasting, okay? And so what happened was this Orson Welles, who was a famous director, actually did a play. He produced a play that was, you know, read on the radio. And it's called Invasion from Mars, okay? Invasion from Mars was a test performed by the positivic, positivistic spirit. Positivistic spirit is, is like a scientific. It's a, everything that it can be known can only be known from material reality. And we must use scientific method to deduce all tr possible truths from that material reality exclu exclusively, okay? That's posit positivism. The positivistic spirit to determine its own zone of influence and one which showed that the elimination of the distinction between image and reality has already advanced to the point of collective sickness, that the reduction of the work of art to empirical reason is already capable of turning into overt lunacy at any moment. Again, so people, when they listened to this broadcast, Invasion from Mars, they had no idea that it was a play, okay? And literally across the country, 
people were acting as if this was a real broadcast and America and the world was actively being invaded from aliens, uh, by aliens from Mars. That's what this was. Who was saying this was such a, an actual interesting scientific exper experiment, if you will, okay? That this work of art, this image being presented already was able to manifest itself in control of human behavior such that because these people thought that this was a reality, okay? An overt lunacy at any moment, a lunacy which the fans who send trousers to the Lone Ranger in saddles to his horse already have effect. That's very important because, I mean, how many people, again, you get, you, we think of, you know, you know, uh, I don't know, t whoever, Tom Brady or some sports guy as, you know, uh, as a walking god on earth. These are people who put tights on and chase balls around fields. Let's be honest. Seriously. It's very, we're going to get, I think the sports section is coming up next. But again, it's, it's, it's a fanaticism about something that is not real. You know, there's nothing redeemable about sports. They're a nice recreational activity for children. That's it. Look at the absolute mania sports causes in our culture, in our world. It is a weapon to destroy the American male, well, the male, the Western male in particular, and it has done a bang up job of it as we're about to see. But again, there you go. You see this, these images he's talking about there, these images of reality are being presented. And again, in the thirties, whenever the attack from Mars happened, an image being presented through a cultural product, distorting people's sense of what is real. <clears throat> That's all I had for you. Okay, here we go. Yeah, sports is the next. And again, I am one of you, all right? I uh, watch a lot of sports. I still enjoy sports from, I had, from time to time. I had my team, you know, maybe next time I'll wear, you know, one of my jerseys with the sport coat over it. So you see, I am one of you as well. I'm not, certainly not judging anyone, anyone whatsoever. Um, that likes, you know, Cardi B, <laughs> well, maybe if you like Cardi B, but, uh, but you know what I'm saying? You know, I, I am not judging. I'm reading these philosophical principles and it's very important because like I said, this Adorno uses the critical theory and he eviscerates the things he's criticizing big time and sports is no different. Here we go. The sporting events from which the schema of mass culture borrows so many of its features and which represent one of its favorite themes have divested themselves of all meanings. Again, sports has no meaning, kind of what I just talked about. They have no meaning. They are nothing but what they are. Sport itself is not play, but ritual in which the subjected celebrate their subjection. Subjected, that's us through sport, are celebrating our subjection, are celebrating our slavery. They parody freedom in their readiness for service, a service which the individual forcibly exacts from his own body for a second time, and then a third time, and then a fourth time, and a fifth time, and then a thousand time. If you're a professional, you've done this you know, thousands, hundreds of thousands of times, right? You're subjecting your body to damage and pain for something, not freedom. In the freedom which he exercises over his body, the individual confirms, confirms what he is by inflicting upon this slave, that's his body, the same injustice he has already endured at the violent hands of society. Okay, I'll read that again. In the freedom which he exercises over his body, the individual confirms what he is by inflicting upon this slave the same injustice he has already endured at the violent hands of society. The passion for sport in which the masters of mass culture sense the real mass basis of their dictatorial power, a form of sadism, if you will, is grounded in this fact. One can play the master by inflicting the original pain upon oneself and others, again, symbolically through a kind of compulsive repetition. I think he explains that with what he just said there a little better, so I'm not going to go into details on that just yet. This is the school for that integration which finally succeeded politically in transforming the powerless into a band of applauding hooligans. Here, here we go. This is where he explains it. 
One is allowed to inflict pain according to the rules. One is maltreated according to the rules. And the rule checks strength in order to vindicate weakness as strength. Weakness here is your inability to supersede the rules. Okay. And again, one is allowed to inflict, inflict pain according to the rules. So not only do you inflict pain upon yourself with every single practice, boom, beating yourself up, beating your body up. I mean, how many of you out there have lifelong injuries because you played sports throughout, through high school even, maybe even into, into, into college, right? Now your knees are bad. Your back hurts constantly, you know? It's because you inflicted pain upon yourself over and over and over again to the detriment of your body, right? But not only that, not only are you allowed to inflict pain upon yourself over and over and over again, and again, as a symbol of what's happening to you in society, you're allowed to inflict pain upon others according to, as long as it's by the rules. As long as it's by the rules. You're allowed to maltreat according to the rules. And, you're ch you're, you're, and, the, and the rule checks strength in order to vindicate weakness as strength. Again, so your weakness is that you can't supersede these rules. And that weakness is perceived in, sporting, in sports to be a strength. The screen is as if the screen heroes enjoy being tortured on film and they do enjoy it and they get paid lots of money and they infantilize us. That means they make us to be like children because we sit there and watch these people kick balls around or throw balls around or hit pucks around or whatever over and over and over again. Nonsense. The rules of the game resemble those of the market. Equal chances and fair play for all, but only as the struggle of all against all. Thus it is that sport permits competition now reduced to a form of brutality to survive in a world in which competition has actually been eliminated because there are the masters of culture who he's talking about but the masters of the monetary the masters of finance are truly the masters of the world and we down here uh, have, seem to have competition but really there's some competition for us for scraps but everything else there really is no competition because the masters have already dominated it and through sporting are dominating you in its naked literalness, in the brutish seriousness which hardens every gesture of play into an automatic reflex, sport becomes the colorless reflection of a hardened, callous life. Sport only preserves the joy of movement, the thought of bodily liberation, the suspension of practical ends, ends in a completely external, distorted form. It's weird. I mean, if you had no idea that sports existed and you, you randomly happened upon, you know, some f football game or something where hundreds of thousands of people are in the stands and they're, you know, chasing balls around fields, you'd be like, what is this? What is it? Nonsense. Why are people doing this? It makes no sense whatsoever, right? That's what he's saying. It's a movement of body in an incredibly distorted form. Yet perhaps the violence which sport inflicts upon people might help them towards understanding how they could one day finally put an end to violence itself. Mass culture takes sport into custody. He's saying even though sport is barbarous in every sense of the word, it does teach some values, teamwork, you know, um, sacrificing for the, for the good of the whole, et cetera, et cetera. Some of these things which, if taken into an intellectual light, can teach people what needs to be done to overcome our problems. They can, but mass culture, saying this culture industry, he actually, this term mass culture, he, 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 he admits in other books that he, he should be saying culture industry whenever he says mass culture. He, you know, again, these are a set of essays that are not written at the same time. So he's refining his, his language as he moves forward. We say the culture industry takes sport into custody. Boy, has it ever. Even if the sportsman might possibly be able to develop certain values like solidarity, readiness to help others, or even enthusiasm, which could prove valuable in critical political moments, nothing of this kind is to be found in the spectator. Nothing, zero, nada, whatsoever. But mass culture is not interested in turning its consumers into sportsmen as such, but only into howling devotees of the stadium howling devotees of the stadium and boy was he way ahead of his time in understanding this stuff way ahead i mean again sports have no value in and of themselves 
we have again gone so far into a false reality that now I just saw this the other day. Was it Tom Brady is now about to become the highest paid sports analyst in history? And they're going to give this man 37 and a half million, something like that, 37, whatever it is. I figure it really isn't that important, but 37 and a half million dollars a year to talk about sports, ladies and gentlemen. And then they, they, they showed the list of other um, sports analysts and there was like Jim Rome makes like 18 million a year. Stephen A. Smith makes like 10 million. You know, it's like people, <laughs> these are people talking about an, an unreality, a foolishness, a child's recreational event. That's how distorted our culture is and our sense of real is. This is why we are being dominated is this culture industry is sports is the the spell that is cast upon us and not only is the just watching sport or playing sport enough you can watch entire channels dedicated to your sport 24 7 and then beyond that you can bet on sports and even beyond that you can play fantasy sports where you are you know literally betting on you know, you, you know um how well people do in, in the so-called real world uh, you know in this weird fiction we're living you can literally you know make your team and how they're doing the real world effects i mean it's a lifestyle for many many millions of people and let me tell you those people that do this again this is the culture industry here is neutralizing these people they're neutralizing the people who are obsessed with pop music they're neutralizing people who are obsessed with more with movies they're neutralizing people who are obsessed with sports <clears throat> and here we go this is where again we're gonna get it even deeper now you can see why this took me a long while to produce these this first episode and that's why this will be a two episode book <clears throat> getting deeper here the schema of mass culture now prevails as a canon of synthetically produced modes of behavior again culture industry is producing acceptable behavior how you are going to behave in your life the following which culture industry can still count on even there where the where tedium and deception seem almost calculated to provoke the consumers is held together by the hope that the voice of the monopoly will tell them as they wait in line precisely what is expected of them if they want to be clothed and fed. We are becoming more and more dependent upon this manufactured culture system. Please tell me what to do. Please, expert, tell me what to think. Tell me what to say. Not only tell me, give me my virtue. That is what you say I will live by, and it will be virtuous. And anyone who doesn't follow this is a heretic. They are anathema. Cast them out, burn them at the stake. Becoming, this is become, again, this is more and more apropos for our day. The first commandment, of course, is that one should already be properly dressed and tolerably well fed. Eh, we still have that at least, right? For the time being. The good manners which the system teaches them presupposes all of this. Anyone who fails openly to parade their freedom, their courtesy, their sense of security, who fails to observe and propagate the established guidelines is forced to remain outside the pale. And these established guidelines have totally degenerated since the time of this writing, right? Totally degenerated. People don't, they wear their jammies to work. They wear their jammies out to do it, whatever, you know? That's just one example. The uh, proper decorum has totally disappeared. <clears throat> And again, that's because that is what the culture products are producing intentionally. <clears throat> it is not so much that misery is concealed in the medium of film, for example. Indeed, it is often depicted with some relish. Again, because it's the, the, like the very first thing we talked about. It's misery because it's the, uh, you're consuming a false reality, a false, of, of, a fake uh, replication of what the actual use is. <clears throat> but the viewer is taught to behave everywhere as if there really were no such thing. In spite of all the sententious humanitarian, sententious means like preach, getting preachy on a, a moral level, you know, in spite of all sententious humanitarianism, the obedient adept becomes even colder, harder, and more pitiless. So there he called it. There he called it. 
you saying all of this and then I, I kind of went in a little diatribe about how the you know the people are wearing their their PJs to everywhere now you know and he's and again the it's the character of people is eroding he's saying here in spite of all sententious humanitarianism being like oh you got to be nice to your neighbor the obedient adept becomes even colder harder and more p- pitiless again because like I said, I put in here, like desensitized Americans, we're becoming more and more desensitized by these cultural products so that we don't care about our neighbor, even though they say you should be humanitarian, right? The more industry exhausts what has already been perverted into commodities in the very name of culture, the more the omnipresence of culture proclaims itself. The shots of leading figures in economic life and other prominent people in their straw hats and padded suits can only be distinguished from those of gangsters by the fact that they take their hats off when they enter the room while they exploit the robust speech of the gangster for the sake of popularity. And really, he's talking about the real gangsters in this world, the real killers, the real bad guys, the guys who wear the padded suits and the straw hats was the fashion of their time. And you can't tell them between the gangsters of his time because these guys, the real killers, take off their hat and they talk nice to you, you know, and they, and they, you know, give you this wonderful culture industry. You know, these guys are the real killers. Thus, these people, these, these gangsters, the real gangsters, thus they prepare the Fata Morgana. Fata Morgana means mirage. They prepare the mirage of a fine society which once again reinforces the medium of the image, the actual destruction in the me, excuse, they reinforce in the medium of the image, the actual destruction of society proper. Again, he's totally prescient in this. He can see the future is what that means. And the transformation of its members into the mannequins of the society page, even as it denies them. Again, it turns you into a mannequin and actually is denying you true happiness. He, uh, I think we're going get, to get into next, because thankfully, Theodore Adorno actually eviscerates the culture industry too. He's very critical of this culture industry, and we'll get there next, I believe. So it's denying them. At the same time, it's turning into the, the, a person who is you know, is consuming all these images of a fine society. It degrades them and uh, denies them true happiness and true livelihood and true fulfillment. Okay? <clears throat> The totality of mass culture culminates in the demand that no one can be any different from itself. And no one is anymore, ladies and gentlemen. The scientific tests upon which employment depends simply follow its example in this. The monopoly shuts its doors on anyone who fails to learn from the cinema how to move and speak according to the schema which it has fabricated. Again, I'll read that one again. The monopoly shuts its doors on anyone who fails to learn from the cinema, from culture, from the, all the cultural goods, how to move and speak according to the schema which it has fabricated. Okay. Anyone who doesn't, you know, read from the tome of the Avengers and can cite all the gods therein is an anomaly that needs to be wiped out. That's what he's painting the picture of here. Today, anyone who is incapable of talking in the prescribed fashion, that is, of effortless, effortlessly reproducing the formulas, conventions, and judgments of mass culture as if they were his own, is threatened in his very existence, suspected of being an idiot or an intellectual. <laughs> People give their approval to mass culture because they know or suspect that this is where they are taught the mores, the value system, they will surely need as their passport passport in a monopolized life again i basically kind of described that all but yes your your life is being monopolized by the schema produced by culture industry the psychological mechanisms involved are secondary today the rationality of adjustment has already reached such a point that the slightest jolt will be sufficient to real it reveal its irrationality I think he didn't know. I mean, he, I think he's incorrect there. Um, he, I think he's kind of wishful in his thinking there that the slightest jolt would reveal to people how irrational their life is if you live by the culture industry. But maybe, maybe he is. I, ho- I hope he's right. 
I certainly hope he's right. The we're not, we're not, oh, wow. Hold on, let me take a, I apologize. I don't like to do this, but um, let me take a drink. I don't like to interrupt, but my voice is getting dry, so forgive me. All right. <clears throat> the renunciation of resistance is ratified by regression. The masses draw the correct conclusion from their complete social powerlessness over against the monopoly, which represents their misery today. So their social powerlessness against the monopoly. And again, you know, nowadays, for all intents and purposes, you and I are completely powerless against the force of the monopoly. Like, the, like that's a good word to put on it, the monopoly, the, the powers that be, the money system, the whatever you want to call them. You know, I don't think that's true. If I, if I, if I believe that was totally true, and he doesn't either. He, but if, if I, if that was totally true, I would not be doing what I'm doing. You know, I wouldn't be exposing this material to you and exposing these ideas to you, you know, cause we are not, we are in a, certainly in a battle of ideas and I am certainly a warrior in the battlefield of ideas. And when you have true ideas and true ideals, I believe you can conquer this, you know, but nonetheless, this, this assessment here is absolutely on point. The masses draw the correct conclusion from their complete social powerlessness against the monopoly, which represents their misery today. And again, the powerless against this, this thing that that furry I referred to can't quite put his or her finger on, you know, and are totally scandalized by all the, 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 the nastiness coming out of the culture industry, you know, that is our misery. Part of it. <laughs> the materialistic explanation of our misery. I'll put it that way. Through this adjustment to the technical forces of production, an adjustment which the system imposes upon them in the name of progress, men become objects that can be manipulated without further objection and thus fall far behind the potential which lies in the technical forces of production. Again, so he says in, the techn in, in progress, I think he defines progress as the ability to dominate material reality. In that sense, we have progressed quite a bit, but this facade of reality that is being put onto us is severely limiting, limiting us in our technological progression, and I think that's absolutely true. <clears throat> but since as subjects, men themselves still represent the ultimate limit of reification, again, men as of yet have not been molded from this abstract thing that they're trying to imprint on us into the concrete realization of that abstract ideal. That's what he's saying here. I'll read that. I'll start this again. But since as subjects, men themselves still represent the ultimate limit of reification. Again, it would be truly if they achieve this, he's absolutely right. If they achieve, which they're with the whole transhumanism movement, and we will hopefully one day get into books on all of this stuff, the transhumanism. I mean, we kind of touched it about it, and I think in the Fourth Industrial Revolution, they're tr certainly trying to bring this in, right? But truly, the limit of reification is mankind, because if they can mold mankind into their image, it would be a direct affront to God, certainly. <laughs> no question about it. But then they would have absolute control of us, right? I'll start again there. But since as subjects, men themselves still represent the ultimate limit of reification, Mass culture must try and take hold of them again and again and again and again and again. The bad infinity involved in this hopeless effort of repetition is the only trace of hope that this repetition might be in vain, that men cannot wholly be grasped after all. That's him hoping that men cannot. That's me too. That's, that's I mean, I think they have, um, the, again, this monopoly has progressed very well and is so far been pretty close to uninhibited in their progress of domination of humanity. And that's what he's saying is that we're subjected to a constant programming through culture industry from birth to death to hopefully one day in their eyes, in the monopoly's eyes, achieve this reification, this production of a total robotic humanity that they control entirely. As a focus of regression, mass culture assiduously concerns itself with the production of those archetypes in whose survival fascistic psychology 
perceives the most reliable means of perpetuating the modern conditions of domination. So in our in these cultural products, again, we'll talk about how the X-Men, oh, how many how many more X-Men movies, how many more bank heist movies, how many more, how many more, keep telling me, please, more, 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 more sports, more music, more Mariah Carey, more, 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 right? They keep repeating these archetypes, these symbols for consumption because the monopoly sees that as the surest way to achieve domination of mankind. Again, like I just stated, I think they have been largely successful in their endeavors. Primeval symbols are constructed on the production line. Primeval symbols are constructed on the production line line on in the cinema again in the music industry in the there's no talent certainly in music there's no talent anymore folks just gonna lay it out there nothing nothing of value there you know but what they're doing is is becoming a more and more refined and produced thing for an end which means there are producers producers are serving some purpose right and then it is primeval symbols i think i can't remember who said it but someone said that the symbols will be their downfall and I, <laughs> I absolutely hope that is so. The dream industry does not so much fabricate the dreams of the consumers as introduce the dreams of the suppliers among the people. Again, it's not the, that they're producing dreams directly in people. It's just that the manufacturing line that produces the cultural goods is what is supplanting imagination and thus supplanting people's dreams and hopes and ambitions. And again, this, this next sentence is so important. This is the thousand year empire of an industrial caste system, slave system, governed by a stream of never ending dynasties. This is the 1000 year empire of an industrial caste system governed by a stream of never ending dynasties. This is what enslavement looks like, total enslavement. Even when you get into people's dreams and their ambitions and their imaginations and you can control that through this culture industry, that is slavery that can last, as he says, 1,000 years. And I think he is, you know, can be quite correct in what he's talking about here. In the dreams of those in charge of mummifying the world, culture industry represents a priestly hieroglyph. Hier hieroglyphic script which addresses its images to those who have been subjugated not in order that they might be enjoyed but only that they are read you just keep consuming don't en keep consuming keep consuming keep consuming the the symbols the symbolism of your subjection from the priestly class from the masters of culture keep consuming it the authentic images of the film screen as well as the inauthentic ones encountered in hit melodies and the well-worn written phrase appears so rigidly and so frequently that they are no longer perceived in their own right, but only as repetitions whose perpetual sameness always expresses an identical meaning. Always. The images are seized, but not contemplated. They are seized, but you don't ever think about what you're watching. People don't ever sit and think, boy, what did I just watch there? What kind of... What good can I draw from it? What intellectual elevation can I achieve by thinking about the cultural th product I just consumed, right? That never happens. Never. People just, again, consumption begets consumption begets consumption. The technology of the mass work of art accomplishes that transition from image to writing in which the absorption of art by monopolistic practice culminates. But the secret, again, the secret doctrine which is communicated here is the message of capital. It must be secret because total domination likes to keep itself invisible. No shepherd and no shepherd and a herd. Nonetheless, it is directed at absolutely everyone. Absolutely everyone. Again, so this mass culture is acting in this mass culture of ultimate materialism, really, which is symbolically being shoved down all our throats that you are just a consumer, you are just a consumer, keep consuming, is cloaking the powers that be, hiding them. In fact, if you were to tell anyone that, 
you know, this culture we live in is um, totally administered and it's, you know, to degrade or degrade you and to make you a unthinking automaton slave. You know, if you were to say that to someone just randomly on the street, they would laugh at you and think that's the furthest thing from the truth. But the reality is, as Adorno is, you know, very eloquently stating, stating here, that is absolutely the case. I think, oh no, I think I have a couple more things here. Here we go. <clears throat> I think he's going to, there's, he does leave us with a little hope in this um, um, last uh, part of this essay. Above all, on the radio, the authority of society, standing behind every speaker, immediately addresses its listeners unchallenged. If indeed the advances of technology largely determine the fate of society, then the techni technicized forms of modern consciousness are also heralds of that fate. They transform culture into a total lie. But this untruth confesses the truth about the socioeconomic base with which it has now become identical. The neon signs which hang over our cities and outshine the natural light of the night with their own are comets presaging the natural disaster of society. It's frozen death. Yet they do not come from the sky. They are controlled from the earth. It depends upon human beings themselves whether they will extinguish these lights and awake from a nightmare which only threatens to become actual as long as men believe in it. And he's saying... This culture industry portends our destruction. It is saying, and I, you know, he's absolutely right. I, I, can't, I can't stress this enough. I agree with him wholeheartedly on a lot of what he's talking about here, but certainly this aspect. If we, this is lulling us to sleep. The culture industry has totally lulled us to sleep. And we are on the brink of disaster, total disaster. All of the systems in our society have ossified you know they become uh, bad you know they don't work anymore science medicine education you name it all of these things no longer serve humanity but are enslaving humanity okay and that portends that tells that a disaster is looming a disaster of probably unknown proportions i mean we just you know, COVID-19 is a, a great example. It is probably the birth pangs of our absolute enslavement as they usher in a new form of human existence with a new economy, et cetera, et cetera, which will, again, just like everything else, will not serve us, but rather enslave us. And I'm going to read one last little section here, and then we'll call this one an episode. <clears throat> but he gets here now into the flaws of the culture industry okay so he you know he eviscerates it as well culture cannot represent either that which merely exists or the conventional and no longer binding categories of order which the culture industry drapes over the idea of the good life as if existing reality were the good life and as if those categories were its true measure again it's giving you a false uh, measuring stick essentially of what is good of what is happiness right again do me again this little sentence here eviscerates the culture industry right it's not serving you it's not making you happy in fact it's making us miserable um, deaths of despair uh, and drug abuses and uh, addictions and alcohol addictions and blah 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 you name it is absolutely exploding right because the culture industry does not generate happiness you, in fact you cannot have happiness in pure materialism, which is what the culture industry is all about. The idea of an objectively binding order, huckstered to people because it is so lacking for them, has no claims if it does not prove itself internally and in confrontation with human beings. The concepts of order which it hammers into human beings are always those of the status quo. Always those of the status quo. Always, always, always. All, I mean, I can't, this is such an important thing. The concepts of order, which it hammers into human beings, are always those of the status quo. And I witnessed this firsthand, you know. People, we, to solve the problems 
of our world now. We need new thinking, new ideas. Doing the same thing over and over and over again, expecting different results is insanity. And that's Einstein's definition. There's more, certainly. Uh, part of insanity is you know, perceiving an unreality as real, which you could say we're in a mass insanity now, and I think you would be right in saying that. But we need new thinking. The status quo must be demolished. The status quo has ushered us into this hellhole we now find ourselves in. It doesn't Again, no Republican, no Democrat, none of that BS is going to stop you. We'll get into that next week when he gets started. Hopefully, I mean, if you've enjoyed this episode, you're really going to enjoy next week as well because we get into you know, some of the politics and things. It's very interesting, okay? But the status quo must be demolished and the culture industry makes sure that you, you know, whether if you are using all these labels, Republican, Democrat, you know, blah, 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 whatever it is, if, you, if, that's, this, if that's the realm you still exist in, you know, you are reinforcing the status quo. The status quo remains unquestioned, unanalyzed, and undialectically presupposed. Even if they no longer have any substance for those who accept them, <laughs> uh, the culture industry is devoid of substance, ladies and gentlemen, and we all accept it. The categorical imperative of the culture industry no longer has anything in common with freedom. Nothing. It proclaims you shall conform without instruction as to what? Conform to that which exists anyway and to which to that which everyone thinks anyway as a reflex of its power and omnipresence. Pavlovian conditioning into our trained behaviors. Our behaviors are good because they are what the television tells us to do. And again, I see someone just walking out there with a mask on their face, you know, no one around them. That's, that's a preconditioned Pavlovian response. You are emotionally attached to these behaviors. They must be true. The power of the culture industry's ideology is such that conformity has replaced consciousness. Again, I'll read, he says it so much better than I could. This guy is a genius, by the way. Let me figure it out. The power of the culture industry's ideology is such that conformity has replaced consciousness. Absolutely, 100%. Beautifully said. It would be so only as good order. The fact that the culture industry is oblivious to this and extols order in abstracto and abstraction bears witness to the importance and untruth of the messages it conveys. While it claims to lead the perplexed, it deludes them with false conflicts, which they are to exchange for their own. Wow, another powerful statement. You know, uh, we're confused. The culture industry confuses the masses. And it deludes them with false conflicts. Again, generated conflicts. You need to hate someone because of their color of their skin or, you know, what religion they profess. You must hate them. Must, must, must hate them. You know, if they don't wear a mask on their face, you must hate them. Must hate, must hate, 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 hate. Fight, 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 fight each other. Again, the same boot that is stamping on the furry's face is the same boot that is stamping on my face and my wife's face and my children's faces, okay? We have a common enemy here. These things that are dividing us are manufactured by the culture industry to cause strife amongst us so that we do not point our finger at the real problem. <clears throat> it solves conflicts for them only in appearance, in a way they can hardly be solved in their real lives. Even its defenders, however, would hardly contradict Plato openly, who maintained that what is objectively and intrinsically untrue cannot also be subjectively good for human beings. Again, that's true, right? So what is objectively untrue cannot be subjectively true and good for people, okay? The concoctions of the culture industry are neither guides for a blissful life nor a new art of moral responsibility, but rather exhortations to toe the line behind which stand the most powerful interests. Again, that's what... We're kind of building to a crescendo here, okay? Toe the line. Everything you consume from this culture industry is telling you to toe the line over and over and over again, over and over and over. I can't tell you. I mean, how many thousands of songs? How many thousands of movies? How many thousands? Again, toe the line. Just keep consuming, keep consuming, and toe the line. The consensus which it propagates strengthens blind, opaque authority. Again, it makes these guys stronger. The more we continue this, it makes them stronger and stronger and stronger. If the culture industry is measured not by its own substance and logic, but by its efficacy, 
by its position in reality and its explicit pretensions, if the focus of serious concern is with the efficacy to which it always appeals, the potential of its own effects becomes twice as weighty. Again, it's incredibly efficient at producing this uh, mentality of conformism. The potential, however, lies in the promotion and exploitation of the ego weakness to which the powerless members of contemporary society with its concentration of power are condemned. Their consciousness is further developed retrogressively, again, exploiting egoism and power in the in powerless members of society perpetually, and it's condemning them, right? And it keeps getting worse and worse and worse. The behavior modification gets better and better and better. The domination of the individual through culture industry becomes more and more complete. It is no coincidence that the cynical American film producers are heard to say that their pictures must take into consideration the level of 11 year olds. In doing so, they would very much like to make adults into 11 year olds. I right there and they have absolutely everything in our society is maintained. All movies, all certainly sports, sports is probably even lower. Um, all music, music is probably even lower. You know, all of it is supposed to be at a sixth grade level of understanding. That's it. That's where the consciousness of our society and the level of thinking is capped at. Boom, sixth grade, 11 year olds, whatever it is. <clears throat> and he's talking about you here in this next part. Only your, only our, only deep unconscious mistrust, the last residue of the difference between art and empirical reality in the spiritual makeup of the masses explains why they have not, to a person, long since perceived and accepted the world as it is constructed for them by the culture industry. So again, only people who are skeptical in nature, who distrust, you know, instead of trusting blindly, we should blindly distrust. That's a very healthy thing to do nowadays is to distrust what people are telling you, you know, what, and again, news is another one I should have been saying in this whole thing too, along with this smorgasbord of other culture industry products, news, distrust it. It should be your disposition. Science, distrust it. That should be your disposition. Last paragraph here, human dependence and servitude. The vanishing point of the culture industry, vanishing point is like, you know, on a picture of a road that disappears in, in the horizon. That's the, the vanishing point. And that's kind of the, the, the point on this work of art that sets the per depth perception for everything else, right? So human dependence and servitude, the vanishing point of culture industry, what culture industries trying to achieve could scarcely be more faithfully described than by the American interviewee who was of the opinion that the dilemmas of the contemporary epoch would end if people would simply follow the lead of prominent personalities. How many people think that you should just follow Biden. You should just follow Trump. You should just follow Obama. You should just follow Bush, blah, 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 endlessly. Just follow them. Just follow them. And they're going to lead us out of our slavery. And they're going to lead us out of our misery. He's saying that is absolutely a farce produced by culture industry, right? Again, politicians are products of the culture industry. Insofar as the culture industry arouses a feeling of well-being that the world is precisely in that order suggested by the culture industry, the status quo, the substitute gratification which it prepares for human being cheats, th cheats them out of the same happiness which it deceitfully projects. Again, so if you're feeling all these happy feelings about how the world is based upon consumption of cultural products, you're deceived. The total effect of the culture industry is one of anti-enlightenment, in which, as Horkheimer and I have noted, that's Adorno and Horkheimer, another author that he produced books with, have noted, enlightenment, that is the progressive technical domination of nature, becomes mass deception and is turned into a means for ferreting consciousness. Right, so it's ferreting consciousness, it's anti-enlightenment, it's destroying consciousness. It impedes the development of autonomous, independent individuals who judge and decide consciously for themselves. These, however, would be the precondition for a democratic society which needs adults who have come of age in order to sustain itself and develop. If the masses have been unjustly reviled from above as masses, the culture industry is not among the least responsible for making them into masses and then despising them while obstructing the emancipation for which human beings are as ripe as the productive forces of the epoch permit. We'll end it there. The culture industry is producing a distinct anti 
enlightenment. Voting is not going to get us out of this bondage unless we have people who are truly freedom-minded individuals. And only then can that now work, I believe, at local levels, maybe state levels. I hope that state levels. But you can see the true predicament that we as a people are facing. Again, I say, you know, when asked, what do I do to combat this? First and foremost, you got to wean yourself off of the culture industry. Uh, read books like this. And by the way, please read this book. There's so much more that I'm not reading in this. I mean, this is why this is going to be a two episode book here. Um, but also practice virtue, practice true goodness, help other people. Don't serve yourself, serve other people. That, I mean, if we all start doing that, they lose rapidly. Um, educate yourself on this, this thing, these, this, this, these ideas, these concepts, and tell other people about it, you know? Education is, you know, what can lead us out of our, our enslavement, certainly. Um, yeah, we will continue with this book next week. I hope, again, I am not judging you personally. I, in fact, I love you. Thank you for watching this. Um, you know, we uh, um, have to come together. We have to stop hating each other. The hate is, again, a manufactured thing. And there's one more um, of our sponsors that I'm going to read, and hopefully this leaves you on a happy note, you know. Um, and this is an ad for Oh for Heaven's Cakes. There's nothing better than treating yourself to some good homemade baked goods. That's where Oh for Heaven's Cake co comes in. The best cupcakes, cupcakes and cakes for special occasions or just a treat. They make incredible specialty items by order or just walk in to find out more. While you are there, enjoy homemade lunch and soup with keto, gluten-free, vegan, and diabetic options. And if you're a business owner and want to treat your employees, check out their monthly employee discounts. Oh for Heaven's Cakes on the north backside of the Grand Cities Mall, open Tuesdays through Friday from 10 to 4, and Saturdays, 9 a.m. to noon. Call 701-757-CAKE. That's 701-757-2253. Or go to oforheavenscakes at yahoo.com. Be a beautiful cupcake in a world full of muffins. O for Heaven's Cakes in the Grand Cities Mall. Order your graduation cakes early, I think. It's, oh, it's probably already sailed, but there you go. O for Heaven's Cakes, awesome place. Grand Cities Mall. I've had multiple delicious offerings from there. It is a wonderful place. Um, and yeah, think about this, what we talked about here. Again, I love you all. God bless you all. I will see you next week with another. The continuation of this is deep stuff, but important stuff. So, you know, don't certainly don't lose hope. That's the opposite of what I want. We can win this. Again, if I was without hope, I wouldn't be doing this. But I am very hopeful of our victory. So, again, I love you and we will talk to you soon. Thank you for watching. <laughs>